All right, Luke chapter 1. The Advent is. The Advent is. The last uh, several weeks we've been talking about the Advent of Christ, the Advent, the arrival of Christ, Christ coming onto the scene. And uh, three weeks ago or four weeks ago we talked about the fact that the Advent is gritty, that, that Christ coming and being born into the world happened within the realities of life that despite how some of our uh, Christmas thoughts towards the story of Christ's birth are uh, created through both uh, pictures and movies and these sorts of things, the, the Advent itself, the birth of Christ itself was gritty. It happened in the, in the realities of the real life of, of real people. And we reminded ourselves that the ad, in the Advent, Jesus intrudes into real life, that he doesn't uh, come here and just simply hang out with the perfect people, wherever they might be. Uh, Jesus dwells with his people. He spends time with his people. And in order to do that, he's going to have to be a part of the realities of the ups and downs, and good, bad, of real life. And finally, Jesus redeems us from where we really are. Jesus doesn't redeem us from simply not being very religious. Jesus redeems us from being dead in our sin. And in order to redeem us, he has to come to terms through the cross of the realities of our rebellion. The Advent is gritty. A couple of weeks ago then, we also reflect on the fact that the Advent is human. That Jesus came as a man. That Jesus didn't come as God in a puppet suit, and then as soon as he uh, left the earth that he was no longer man. Jesus came as a man. He is both fully God and fully man. And, and he encountered and ministered and served with ordinary people, unimportant people, and conflicted people. People dealing with significant conflict in their life, both because of their own sin and the sin of others. The advent, the arrival of Christ on the scene of the world is an extraordinarily human narrative, a human story where God comes as a human and lives and serves and redeems real human people. Finally, last week talked about the advent is inconvenient. Now, none of these are happy Christmas thoughts, so you might have chosen the wrong church this morning. I don't know. But this is the realities of it. The Advent is terribly, terribly inconvenient. When the Advent happened, it created all kinds of controversy for Mary and, Mary and her family. And so we, we talked about the Advent bringing controversial morality. Why would God come in the flesh to an unmarried woman? What will people say? The Advent is inconvenient. When God works, He does things very different than we might expect. The Advent is inconvenient because of the power of God is worked through the powerless. We would love it if God would give us all the power to do everything we ever wanted. Instead, God comes to the powerless. Powerless power. And finally, the Advent is inconvenient because the Advent fulfilled prophecy. And all of those prophecies said Jesus will go and die. Those prophecies said Mary and Joseph would flee for their lives to Egypt. And those prophecies said that they would have to live in the backwater hick town of Nazareth. All of it fulfilled with pro fulfilled prophecy, and we, sometimes we think, well, certainly if we're fulfilling prophecy, we must be skipping from one spiritual and religious high to, to the next, and the prophecies that were being fulfilled in the life of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were extraordinarily painful. The Advent is gritty. The Advent is human. The Advent is inconvenient. Finally, this week, you're like, well, how could it get any worse? Okay, it's going to... The Advent is hopeful. The Advent is hopeful. In the midst of the grittiness, the humanness, and the inconvenience of it all, the Advent is hopeful. And I want you to reflect on the story of, of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth at the first part of Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, Luke chapter 1, it says this, In the time of Herod the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. Did I say Zechariah earlier? Okay. I misspeak on occasion. So Zechariah was a priest, and, and, the, and Luke starts the whole story by saying, In the time of who? Herod the king of Judea. 
So the, so the beginning of the story itself is one fraught with all kinds of political conflict for, for Jews. And there is Zechariah, who is a priest, and his wife Elizabeth, and they are both descendants of Aaron, which is significant. And these folks were faithfully serving and following God. The Bible says that they were blameless in their following of God's regulations. That doesn't mean that they were sinless, far from it. How do we know they weren't sinless? They were alive. Everyone sins. In fact, the Bible says all have gone astray. So we're not saying they were sinless, but they, in a very religious and uh, uh, blameless way, followed the regulations of the temple worship. And the Bible says this in verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. They had no children, and their time for having children had long since passed away. The Advent is hopeful, and this story of Zechariah, I want you to think of it this way. Hope for the doubters. Hope for the doubters. Zechariah's division was drawn by Lot, and so he went in, and they were serving in the temple. In fact, Zechariah himself was drawn by chance, if you believe in chance in the Bible, and he was the one who was going to go in and deal with the incense in the temple. And there was many, many priests. One estimation is there was between 18 and 20,000 priests who would serve. And so be, to be selected to go in and do the incense, the odds were so against you in doing that, it might happen in your priestly life once. One time you might be selected uh, to do this. So it's a very unusual occurrence for Zechariah to be able to go in and to do the incense. And, and while he was in there, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And, and the angel of the Lord said this to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. You say, why would an angel have to say that? Well, you wouldn't ask that question if you had children. <laughs> That's terrible. Why would you say that? Why would anybody say that? But he is saying, he said, you, the, 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 the desire of your heart for a child would be granted to you. Now, if, if you have ever had any kind of concern over your ability to have children or your family to, to have children or infertility, you know what this means to him. You know what this would mean to Elizabeth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Zechariah then asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel of the Lord, we're going to discover in a minute, the angel Gabriel, is standing there in front of you, and, or Zechariah in this case, and he says, I don't know if you noticed, Gabe, um, I'm an old guy, and I didn't marry a young wife. My wife is of the same age as me. As though Gabriel needed an education on how biology works. Like, uh, Oh, oh, geez, Zechariah, you're right. I had no idea you were an old man. I thought God had sent me to a young couple. Zechariah's heart here is, is revealed instantly. He is one who doubts God's ability in this situation. God has a plan to provide a child for Zechariah, and, and Zechariah actually doesn't think God can pull it off. Now, certainly, if you would have asked Zechariah that question, Zechariah, do you think God can make it so an old person could have a baby, what would Zechariah say? He'd say the, the good churchy answer, of course, God can do anything. But, but, but Zechariah's question revealed his heart. His heart was filled with doubt. And here's why this is important for us. When the angel discovered that Zechariah's heart was filled with doubt and fear and questioning, didn't buy it, didn't think it could happen, it had been years and years of despair... And now all of a sudden he's supposed to shift gears and say, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Isn't it interesting that the angel doesn't pack up his bags and leave? Isn't it interesting that Gabriel says, oh, I thought I had somebody who had a good attitude. Since you're a doubter and you have a, such a terrible attitude, Zechariah, God can't do his thing through you. Isn't that how we sort of process things? Well, God can only do a thing through me if I really believe him. 
God can only work if I really trust him and I'm, I haven't settled in my heart that he's the man, he's going to get it done. And here we have the, the angel Gabriel coming to Zechariah and it's no surprise to the angel at all, that, at all that Zechariah doesn't buy it. The angel knew this was going to happen. God probably told him. Gabriel, though, is not going to let it fly unchecked and he responds to Zechariah's doubt. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been... St- sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. This good news, in fact, Zechariah, that you are taking as bad news because of your doubt. The the angel Gabriel says, I have been sent by God on purpose to provide for you good news, news that's supposed to make you want to throw a party for your friends. And you have taken this good news as, as bad news. Of course, you're familiar with the story. This is a story we're all familiar with. And Gabriel says, listen, this thing's going to be done. This, this is on. It's happening. But until that time where your child is born, you're not going to be able to speak. You're going to no longer speak for that time frame. During this whole time while Gabriel and Zechariah are having their conversation, the people outside are waiting for him to finish up, and they're wondering what's going on. And, and when he comes out, they realize he can't talk, and he's had a vision. And then Zechariah goes home to his wife Elizabeth and she becomes pregnant with a baby in her old age. The Advent is hopeful. And in fact, it's hopeful, it's hopeful for the doubters. We think it's, the Advent and the Christmas season is only hopeful and encouraging for those people who just seem to have that bubbly spirit and are always happy and skipping around. And In fact, it provides hope for people like Zechariah who doubt the work of God in their life. Where is God? In fact, we have Zechariah here is, is more than just a, a where is God, what is he going to do? He's, he's a religious sufferer. I might suggest, and this just really reveals my bias, that religious suffering is the worst kind of all because this is a person who has, through the balance of his life, sought the Lord with a genuine heart and sought to, to seek him because he valued God. Zechariah is not painted as a, as a clod. He just doubted. And the balance of his life is this faithful service, and, and you get to the end, you say, God, I know I'm serving you because I love you, but, but at some point, God, isn't there anything to show for it? I mean, it's just one small little thing I've asked for, nothing else, just a baby. And now as he's an old man, and the time has long since passed when he can have a baby, he's saying what many of us would say, where is God in this? And I'll pray for it, but I certainly can't be expected to pray for it with any kind of joyful expectation. I will pray for it out of religious duty and obligation. Many of you have probably prayed prayers like that, if not for a child, for something else, and you've prayed, I don't know that I want to ask for it anymore because I don't want to be let down again. I don't want to be let down again. Gabriel, not Gabriel, he's the angel, Zechariah, along with us, in those moments we question God, we question God's power. He, does he have the ability to do the job here? Or we, or we pr- question God's presence. If, if God were here and he knew what was going on here, he would deal with it. If he really understood what was going on here, we'd deal with it. Or what we all do, and this is all of us, this is universally true. It's not just the person next to you. We question God's goodness. Okay, God, you, you have the power and you know what's going on, but I'm not sure if you are being nice. Are you good? Christ comes in the middle of the darkness of Zechariah's life and he gives hope not because Zechariah is trusting, not because Zechariah has ginned up the internal faith to buy that God can do a thing. This is so cool for me. Now, hopefully for you too. You're here. I'm hoping it is too. But for those of us who, who question and doubt and, and our, our hearts can be filled with darkness, we think, well, God will never show up now because I've got a bad attitude. And, and, and Gabriel shows up anyway. Gabriel shows up even in the questioning, even in the doubt, even in the, I don't think God's going to ever come through on this one. Gabriel, though, doesn't leave our doubt and our fear unchecked. He calls a spade a spade as he ought to. Despair, when we question God's power and his presence and when we question his goodness, really is a form of rebellion. It's saying, I know more about a thing than God knows. 
And God comes and he invades Zechariah's life despite his doubt, despite his questioning, and he provides him a son. He gives him a son. But I want you to understand something here. God provides an answer to Zechariah's prayer, but why does he do it? Does he do it because Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth want a baby? Well, no. Why did he do it? Because the Savior needed his prophet. So the work of God is done in the life of a guy who doesn't deserve it because he's not even sure if God's going to show up. The work of God is done in his life even though he doubts it. And not just merely to provide him the joy of a child, although that is joyful. It's to provide him the joy of a child who will be the forerunner to the Messiah. So God is answering Zechariah's prayer. God is giving his hope, giving him hope because he wants to draw Zechariah into something bigger than just answering his wishes. God wants to draw him into his work of redemption for mankind. God gives hope to the doubter, not by just simply answering his wish list, but, but rather by inviting him in to be used into the work redemption that is call, God is call, calling him into. God is the one who finally melts the heart. This is not an act of trying to just rest and relax and feel the vibe or whatever you're into. I don't know. This is an act where God invades a hardened heart and melts it for his purposes. The advent is hopeful. And I love the story of Zechariah because for those of us who, who see the, the world as a glass half full or who stole my glass or... The world is blessed with pessimists because we're happy to let you know what the world is really like. Or actually the job, I, I tend to run a little bit pessimistic. I hope you don't question my character for that. Question for other things, certainly, but not for that. You know, the job of a pessimist is to let the optimists know that they don't see things right. And so God comes in and says, listen, even though you question and you're cynical and I'm going to melt your heart. I don't need you to try and figure out how to do that. I'm going to do that. God is the one. He provides hope for us who doubt and are full of fear and question God's goodness and his power and his presence. And we think because I'm questioning all these things, God certainly can't do his thing anymore. Yes, he can. And yes, he will. The Advent is hopeful. He provides hope for the doubters. Moving on. God's, the Advent is hopeful. He provides hope for the weak. Someone like Mary is then visited by Gabriel, and, and Gabriel visits Mary. We just read the passage, and Gabriel says to Mary, you're, you're going to have a, a son. You are highly favored. Mary is not highly favored because she was a goody two-shoes, more spiritual than the rest of us. Why was Mary highly favored? Because God chose to use her. She was favored by God because God in his sovereignty decided she was the one. She didn't deserve it any more than anyone else. We, this is an aside. Pet peeve. Are you ready for a pet peeve? When did we get this story going that Mary was the best girl in Sunday school so she got to have the baby? This is not in the Bible. Mary is favored because she was a sinner like the rest of us. God showed up and said, I'm going to use you. He favors her simply because he's that gracious and generous. And so Gabriel shows up. Pet peeve is over. Moving on. Okay. Gabriel shows up and says, Mary, you're highly favored. You're going to have the baby. You're going to have the Messiah. You're going to give his name Jesus because he, as we learned in Matthew, is going to save the world from, from their sins. And Mary says, she asks a question much like Zechariah did, but she didn't ask it in doubt as well as, as much as just a question. She says, how is this even possible? And again, like Zechariah, this is a question of biology. She says, I'm a virgin. And, and the angels are, you're right, that's the intention here. The Holy Spirit will do a work in you that you will have a child. How could God use me, Mary would say. I'm a, I'm, I'm a single girl on the margins of society. And, and the one thing that I could bring to the table, perhaps, is fertility. But even that I can't bring to the table because I'm unmarried. How could God use me? The Advent is hopeful because there's hope for the weak. Sometimes we process the relationship with, we have with God and, and we view God through the same grid or the same filters we view the rest of the world, and that is this. God, like everyone else, looks at what we do and what we have to offer 
The world is a meritocracy. Life is you get what you earn. The sweat you put in is what you're going to get out. People respect you if you're respectful. People will look up to you if you're honorable. You'll, you'll earn a lot if you work hard. And God is like everyone else. It's a meritocracy. And God comes in and just shows up with Mary and says, in her weakness, in her, frankly, very little to offer, he, she, he says, I will use you. The weak person questions God's ability to work with their particular issues, their particular bents, their particular shortfalls. Well, God could certainly use me if only I was more outgoing, if only I was less weak, if, if only I didn't have these addictions, these concerns, these personality dispositions, uh, if only I had more money, or only if I had less money, or if only I had a better family, or only if I had less family. It's Christmas time. I threw that one in for some here. And we say, well, God could certainly work through me. I, I can certainly see how God could work through someone like me, but I've got too many issues. My issues have issues. We quote that great American Bible verse, God helps those who help themselves. You know, it's not in your Bible. Who does God help in the Scripture? The helpless. Amen. The helpless. God helps the helpless. The angel says this to Mary to encourage her in her weakness, a little bit different than the, the, the gentle, really, correction of Zechariah. She says this, Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. Notice Gabriel knew she was old, Zechariah. She who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Listen, nothing is impossible with God. Even your weakness. If God can use Elizabeth in her age, Elizabeth with her barrenness, Zechariah in her doubt, Mary God can use you in your weakness. You have nothing to bring to the table on this one, and that's precisely what God is looking for. The Advent is hopeful because God gives hope for the weak, because God is not asking us to, to do the work, per se. He's asking us to be available to allow Him to work through us and in us. You know, sometimes we read the passage by the Apostle Paul in the letter he wrote to the Corinthians. He says, for your sake, in your presence, I became weak. And we think, well, the reason Paul was able to be weak was because if he wanted to, he could have turned on the heat and brought the strength. And the Apostle Paul is not saying that. What the Apostle Paul is saying in that passage is, I had the option of being strong or weak. The better option is weak. It's not that in this case, this is the better way to go. Paul is saying, when I am weak, God shows up in his strength. We want God to show up in our strength. It makes us feel more confident. It makes us feel useful. It, may, it makes us feel like we have something to contribute. But the Advent really is hopeful precisely for the fact because he works in and through the weak. I'll put it this way. The journey of the Christian life is discovering how glorious and powerful God is over the balance of your Christian life, and as you make those discoveries, you realize how weak you really are. I think sometimes we flip that in our heads. We think as we mature in faith, as we get to know God better, we're going to get more and more confident and strong and, uh, I don't know, grow spiritual muscles or something like that. What's funny is the journey of the spiritual life is a journey of descent, to discover the level and degree of our weakness that Christ might be made stronger. The maturity revealed in the Christian life is one who has greater and greater dependence on God, not one who has great, less dependence on God. And Mary shows this, the angel shows this to Mary. The Advent is hopeful because it provides hope for the weak. Look with me over at Mary's song. We often call it the Magnificat. And by often, I mean only in church. Mary's song. I'm going to read it. It's a beautiful song. I'm going to read Mary's song. I have some comments on it. We'll also read Zechariah's song and a couple of comments on it, and then we'll be closing. This is the song. Mary said, 
My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. I want to remind you, just as we jump into this, how Luke started this in verse 5. In the time of who? Herod the king of Judea. This is a prayer of Mary, a song of Mary that is prayed in faith, in weakness, knowing that true strength, political strength, was still sitting the throne of Rome and Judea. But she, in her weakness, knows the strength of God to work what he was doing through the Messiah, and she says, his great arm will do great works. He will reduce the proud. He will empty the rich. He will scatter the those who are self-sufficient, and rather he will lift up and fill the hungry and weak. The blessing here from Mary comes in not becoming strong. The blessing here from Mary comes in seeing God become strong in her. The blessing here is that God's might comes through in our weakness. Not that our weaknesses are eliminated, and now all of a sudden, okay, I can be strong, The whole point is in our weaknesses, the strength and power and might of God is revealed. Let's just think for a minute. Think of your biggest weakness. I'm going to give you a tip. Maybe you have a job interview later and somebody says, what's your greatest weakness? What is it? You got to know this one. I work too hard. Okay, put that away. Put it in your pocket. That's a freebie if you're looking for a job. Think of your greatest weakness. It might be a sin. It might be a personality issue. I don't know what it is. You know what it is because it's something that bothers you. Drives you nuts. I wish this wasn't true about me. And you think, well, I know what will happen. He's got to work on me. He'll mature me. And he'll take this weakness and make it a strength. Now think of it this way. Say, for example, God did just that. He worked a fabulous miracle in your, your life. And that weakness you currently have becomes a strength. Imagine that it becomes as strong as it possibly could in you. Maybe right now you're very insecure and you pray God would make you very secure. So you become a very confident and outgoing person. Now, in your greatest level of confidence and outgoingness, will you ever be as confident and as outgoing and able to reach out to others as God is? Well, the answer, of course, is no. So why would I ever want my weakness to be made into my strength? What I would prefer to have happen, as Mary had happened, is for God's strength to be made known. Because His strength will far surpass my greatest strength. And even if my greatest weakness were strength, it would never equal the strength of God. So the purpose here is not for me to become strong. The purpose here is for God to do a work that his strength might be revealed in me. And this is what Mary prayed. She prayed that she would be lifted up in God's strength. Blessing comes from God's might in our weakness. If you're a basketball coach or a football coach or a soccer coach, or perhaps even if you're seeking to hire somebody for a company that you work at or work for, you will always be looking to get people on your team that will make your team better. And in fact, if you're a good boss or a good coach, you would like a good team that will make you look good. And there's nothing wrong with that. You want a good team. You want to be a good coach. That means when we hire or recruit people for teams or work, we're looking for people through their ability that are going to add something to the table that will make me look good. God does it a little bit different. God is looking for the worst people so that he can get them on his team. And then when his team wins, everybody will say, that God is good. He is strong. He could get the worst possible team ever put together and still have total victory. He is strong. He's not looking to accentuate our strengths. He's seeking to demonstrate his own glory and strength by bringing our weaknesses to bear. 
This is why the greatest way for, for God to achieve glory in you is by the Son of God through His Spirit to work in you through your weaknesses. This is unpalatable for us. I don't like it any more than you do. I would prefer to do the things I'm really good at really well and have God bless them than I can tell people how amazing I am. And what God wants to do is show His glory by working extraordinarily well through the stuff I'm lousy at. What is Mary really bad at before she's married? Having children. Really hard. There's a lot of things she could probably do extraordinarily well. But one of the things she just simply doesn't have the ability to do on her own is bear a child. And God says, I'll use that. No, God. What about my submissive heart and willingness to serve? No, I don't need that so much. I need you as a virgin. And God comes to us and says, I want to work through you in a number of ways. And we're just praying and hoping that he will recruit us to team Jesus because we've got a lot of good gifts he could probably use. And frankly, it's just my opinion. I may be off the reservation here. He's looking at none of them. He's looking at your weaknesses and saying, I will show myself to be great by using them here. The Advent is hopeful, provides hope for the weak because God is glorified in revealing His strength by working in and through those of us who are extraordinarily weak, which frankly is all of us. The Advent is hopeful because the weak are made strong and finally, doubters are delivered. Doubters are delivered. I'm going to read Zechariah's song here. This is what Zechariah said, filled with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know the story, when they, after John was born, eight days after he was born, they went to circumcise him, and they were going to name him. And his wife was saying, his name is to be John, and nobody would believe her. And finally, Zechariah made clear that his name was John, and as soon as he made it clear his tongue was loosed, he was able to speak again, and he praised the Lord in this way. Listen. Verse 68 of Luke chapter 1. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He's speaking of Jesus. As he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Verse 76, And you, my child, now speaking of his son John, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. Excuse me, peace. Doubters are delivered. Here is Zechariah having been worked on through the work of God and his angel Gabriel, and he has expressed faith. His heart has been melted by the work of God himself. God didn't need Zechariah to gin up within him the faith to believe he was at work. God did that work in Zechariah. And now Zechariah, in faith that God had granted him, was declaring that God would, in fact, deliver his people through the Messiah who was being born. This is something I just want to leave with you in regards to doubt. All of us have doubt to some degree or another. Some, it's more than others. Um, if you say you don't have doubt, I would just say, well, I doubt it. That's all I got on that. I'm going to let you know something. We get a little bit confused about the role of faith in the work of God. God is at work, and he calls us into faith to trust him in it. I'm going to say this, and I hope it's not misunderstood. God doesn't need his to trust him to do his work. God calls us to trust him because he's doing his work. But he is not waiting idly by, oh, I've got a pretty awesome thing to do. The first time I see somebody, trust me, I'm in. God doesn't call us or need us to trust him to do his work. He calls us to trust him because he's going to do it. 
God created us in the image of God and called us to have dominion over the world. So I think God had a notion of doing this before the world was created, and I know he did. So God creates the entire world, the entire universe, creates mankind, man and woman, and puts us on the earth that we might have dominion over it. Was God waiting idly by to create the world so that we might trust him to exercise our dominion? No, because we didn't exist. He creates and he works because that's what he's going to do and he calls us to trust him in it. Jesus is sent to the world to die the Redeemer's death and raise the victor's resurrection that we might receive salvation. And, and did, did God hold back on that and wait and wait and wait until somebody would trust him to do it? No. The book of Ephesians says that was the plan since when? Before the creation of the world. So does God need us to gin up some, some notion of faith and rest and trust and confidence in him in order for him to work? No, he's going to do his thing. He's asking us in the work he's doing to trust him in it. Doubters put on themselves this burden that God is sitting by and he won't do anything until I can finally get over this conflict in my soul. And I would say this, that's not what happened in Zechariah's life and that's not been the pattern of God. God has made a pattern of intruding on the lives of the hardened and the cold and the skeptical and making himself known to them and melting their hearts. John, the prophet, was sent to go on ahead of the Savior. It says here, according to Zechariah, he declares it, that he will go on before the Lord and prepare the way for him. How does John prepare the way for the Lord? He calls people to repentance. That was the message of John. In fact, the disciples were reminded of this over and over. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. When John proclaimed, he showed up and he told everybody there were dirty, rotten sinners. In fact, the religious people he called what? A brood of vipers. And he was toning it down because there were kids in the room. And so John comes out and says, you need a Savior. That was his whole message. All he did was tell people, you are dead in your sin. You need to repent. Your lives are filled with sin. Come and get baptized by me. And baptism was a means by which you said, I am identified with the teaching of this teacher. So a person baptized into the baptism of John the Baptist was openly declaring, I'm a sinner and I repent. My life is full of sin and I repent of it. And then what, what does Jesus do as John is going and preparing the way for him? Jesus comes down to the river, sees John the Baptist, and what happens? Do you remember? He just sort of evaluates his work, his, his technique on the baptisms. He says, oh, you're doing pretty good. And watch the left elbow. Don't want to get baptistry elbow. <laughs> well, Jesus gets baptized. Why would Jesus get baptized by John? Why would Jesus get baptized by John? We talked about this before. There's nothing wrong with the review. Because Jesus says, I want to be identified with who? The sinners. Jesus doesn't repent, need to repent of anything, but in being baptized by John, he's saying, I want to be identified, not with the holy and righteous, because there aren't any. I'm identifying with the sinners. So John's job was to come and make known to the sinners, they are sinners. Jesus' job was to come and identify with the sinners that he might make a way for them to be redeemed from their sin. So Jesus, in being baptized by John, says, I am the weak one. I am the one in my weakness who sinned. I am the one in my weakness feel that God can't use me. I am the one in my weakness that says I have nothing to bring to the table. Jesus is identifying with the sinner. Jesus is identifying with the one who doubts and says, I don't think God can Use me. I don't think God is that good. I don't think God is that powerful. I think God is on break. And Jesus is baptized and says, I am that doubter. How do we know that? The Bible says this, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We must understand when he went to the cross, he took all of that. And it wasn't that he just sort of a passing glance at our sin. He says, no, I am your sin. I am fully and completely identified in who I am. My, my identity and my personhood is your sin. I take your doubt, 
I take your weakness, and I will take all of that, and I will take it to the cross, and I will shed my blood for it on your behalf, that my blood might wash it away. Three days later, he raises from the dead, and our sin is gone. He's had victory over it all. And you say, well, I'm weak. And Jesus says, I'm sorry, what? I think I put that in the grave. I am strong. You say, well, I doubt. He said, I put that in the grave. I will melt your heart. I can and I will do it. The Advent is hopeful. My prayer is it's hopeful for you who are weak and are well aware of your weaknesses and feel like you dwell on them and can't stop thinking about them, whatever it is, and you're saying, God, take these weaknesses away, and I would assure you God has intention of working in your weaknesses. The Advent is hopeful for those who need it. And I would say this, the, the Advent is hopeful, hopeful excuse me, for even those who are hardened to it. Christ has come to make us strong in Him, and Christ has come to soften our doubting hearts that we might rest in Him. Will you join me as we stand? I'm going to have a time for you to pray and respond. Your week is probably, if your week is like mine, is about to get real busy, real fast. This might be the last few minutes you have just to quietly pray. I'm going to give you a moment, just a couple of minutes here to pray quietly where you stand, and I'll just challenge you with our two points for the weak and the doubters. If, if you are weak and your weaknesses are in front of you, you're I would suggest that you just come before the Lord and thank Him for it and ask Him to see how He's going to work in your weakness. Ask Him to, to show you how He's going to make Himself strong in your heart. And if you're here this morning and you're going into another holiday season with a, a hardened and skeptical heart like many of us do, this is a great time to come before the Lord and say, Lord, just soften me. I can't do it on my own. I can't gin up the soft heart. Lord, soften me. Help me see your goodness and grace during this time. Let's take a few minutes just where we stand and pray quietly. After a minute or two, I'll close in prayer and we'll sing one final Christmas song. Let's pray together.